right, well, I will get going. Um, first, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Jen Farmer. I'm the CEO at the Friedrichs Taxia Research Alliance. And I've been with FARA now for almost 20 years. Um, and I, I started my professional life as a genetic counselor and clinical research coordinator at the University of Pennsylvania and Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And um, that's how I got to learn about Friedrich's ataxia and how I got to learn about Farah and how I got to meet my, uh, my partner in today's presentation, Ron Bartek, who hopefully you all know uh, as the co-founder and president of Farah. So it is um, Ron and I's pleasure to welcome you all today for this update on what FARA is doing to advance pediatric research initiatives and advocacy. Um, we, we appreciate that there are many new parents and families that have um, joined our FA community in the last few years. And we know that nobody wants or chooses to be a part of this community because of the impact it has on their children and their loved ones. Um, but we greatly respect and value that you choose to be with us on this mission to find treatments for Friedrich's ataxia and that you choose to be informed and engaged in this process. Um, and so we thank you for that. We also thank you for reaching out to us recently to ask Farah, you know, what is it that we're doing specifically to advance pediatric drug development? And so today um, we'd like to take you through a little bit of history um, so that you know that this is not a new initiative. This has been where we started um, back when Farah was established in 1998, that there's been a long-term commitment to pediatric drug development. And just to provide you with some of that background. I think some of the recent questions and concerns from the FA community around pediatric drug development come from um, our recently approved first treatment, Skyclaris, and the fact that Skyclaris is currently approved in individuals 16 and older. And many of you um, are experiencing and sharing with us your concerns for the disparity that this creates because there is a lack of access to this newly approved treatment for children. And we share this concern with you and view this as a priority, but I think it's important for us to also share kind of how we got to where we are, the lessons we've learned along the way and how we're gonna take that forward um, with our future research initiatives and our advocacy efforts. And then, um, We'll give you some additional pipeline updates for other treatments that are in development, um, as well as research updates. And Ron will share with you what, um, what we are doing on the advocacy front and hopefully leave enough time for your questions. As you have questions, please put them in the Q&A um, within the Zoom. That will hopefully help us um, manage them that we can't look between the chat and the Q&A um, to find all of your questions. So just getting started, um, we put together this overview to share FARA's commitment um, and the FA research community's commitment to pediatric research. This goes back over 20 years. Our very first clinical trial of idabinone was initiated in both adults and in children simultaneously. Um, and there have been many other clinical trials um, that have included children and two current ones ongoing, both the vitiquinone study and the NAD and exercise study. There have also been a lot of other observational studies, natural history studies, biomarker studies that have also, um, been able to, you know, specifically um, facilitate research in children, which is important because we need these observational studies to be able to do clinical trials in the long term. 
And we'll talk a little bit more about this as we go through. Um, just a little background on, you know, laws that are in place to um, ensure pediatric research equity and some of the legislation that exists to help incentivize and promote drug development. Um, there are there is legislation in place, right, that um, really makes sure that we conduct safety and efficacy studies in children when there, when there are conditions that affect pediatric individuals. And there are incentives in place, such as this um, Best Pharmaceuticals for Children Act to incentivize um, pharmaceutical companies to conduct pediatric trials. Um, another incentive that we'll talk about later is um, the pediatric rare disease vouchers. And so there, there is legislation in place to, and a framework in place for clinical trials in children. And the FDA um, specifically, you know, these comments right now are focused on the US, um, but there, and, and we can talk about global as well, um, but Ron and I are most familiar with the, the US-based um, legislation as well as the FDA. There are um, also guidance documents that can guide sponsors when they are in the process of drug development on when and how to include children in clinical trials. And there's um, a really important guidance document that highlights the ethical considerations for clinical trials in children. And it specifically points out that these trials are necessary. We need safety and efficacy data um, in children. And at the same time, this guidance document also wants to be able to offer some protection for children um, from risks associated to investigational products. And really, you know, the principles of this document are the following. Um, it's important to put forward a scientific necessity for, assess for assessing um, investigational products in children. It's important to be able to understand what the risks are and that when there is more than a minimal risk to also have prospective benefit for children if they're going to participate in clinical trials and really to be able to address kind of this risk benefit, um, kind of the weighing of the risks and benefits and to be thoughtful to try to ensure that um, those risks don't unduly outweigh those benefits. And that you've also gone through a process of trying to mitigate those risks as much as possible um, for children. The takeaway that I have from this guidance and from my 20 years um, working on trying to develop therapies for FA and different treatment approaches that we've been investigating is that there isn't one size that fits all here. Um, and that's because every therapy will have different risks and benefits associated with it. And so um, trying to mitigate these risks or um, balancing these risks with certain benefits is, is not a one size fits all. And so while we can try to you know, develop a path forward for inclusion of pediatrics and clinical trials as early in the drug development as possible, there won't just be one path. So just a little bit about um, the history with Skyclaris, in case you are not familiar, um, just a little bit of background here. So Skyclaris is the first approved treatment for Friedrich's ataxia. The FDA approved this treatment on February 28th. 2023, um, and they approved it for individuals with FA 16 and older. And this is just a chart showing the results from the very first clinical or from the efficacy trial that was done. And what you see on the right is that the individuals 
In the blue arm of the study were on the treatment, they were on Skyclaris or OMAV. And the gray line is the placebo group. And what this is showing you is that over uh, 48 weeks or a year, um, individuals in the treatment group or in the placebo group got a little worse on their neurologic rating scale, the MFARS. And individuals taking Skyclaris um, got a little bit better and maintained that improvement over the course of a year. The drug was um, studied even further in an open label extension study that was ongoing until this year. And additional data from the open label extension study has shown that um, over the course of two to three years, what we see is that um, the benefits of Skyclaris are maintained and individuals on Skyclaris um, continue to have less change in their neurologic function compared to matched natural history control subjects. And so it's been um, kind of summarized from that data that it looks like Skyclaris can slow disease progression by a little bit more than 50% over those few years that we've been able to evaluate it. And both this data from the uh, MOXIE clinical trial, as well as the open label extension, is what helped get that drug approved. So how did we come about studying OMAV in FA? Um, back in uh, 2009, 2010, uh, FARA was funding several different academic researchers that who identified that in individuals with FA and in animal models uh, with FA, there is a consequence of frataxin deficiency. Uh, and that is that this metabolic pathway, which we're not going to talk about in detail, and RF2 is paradoxically downregulated. Um, and it was identified by multiple groups that this might be a potential target for therapy for FA. Um, there was um, a young boy named Jack diagnosed with FA, and his mom was reading this literature and kind of connecting some dots to this literature, some other literature she was reading about um, different drugs that were being developed and work that her husband was doing for a company that was developing drugs that activated this NRF2 pathway. And she kind of connected all these dots and called Farah and said, hey, I have an idea from reading some literature I want to share with you. And have you ever heard of this company, Riata Pharmaceuticals? Because they're developing drugs that you know, can increase this NRF2 pathway. And Ron, um, when he took this mom's call, um, took all the information, brought it back to our scientific advisors, and very quickly, Farah had reached out to Riata, introduced ourselves. We flew down to Dallas to meet them in person and to explain to them about FA and why we thought that maybe they might be developing drugs that could help us. It did take us a little while to convince them. They were not developing these drugs for Friedrich's ataxia, for neurologic disease. They were developing these drugs uh, for indications in kidney disease. But once they had a chance to really look at things, they recontacted us and said, yeah, we, we think we might be able to help. And we'd like to work with you to start learning more about FA and plan the first clinical trials. And early on when we started working that, with them back in 2015, 2014, um, Ron and I shared with them that it was critically important to develop these drugs, not just for adults, but also for children. At that time, they didn't think it was going to be feasible to begin trials in adults because they did not have a lot of safety data um, that would support going forward into pediatrics at the very beginning. They um, had enough information on the drug, both from preclinical animal studies as well as studies in healthy volunteers to initiate a clinical trial in adults, um, but not in kids, because they hadn't done things like juvenile toxicology studies. And 
we also didn't know if these drugs were going to work in FA. And so kind of the quickest path forward at that time was to initiate that first trial. But we were able to convince them to not start at 18, but to propose to FDA that they at least start in 16 year olds. And I raise this point because I just want you to know this is something that Riata and Farah has been discussing all along through this development process of Skyclaris. So we got the results from that first clinical trial that showed that indeed the drug might be doing um, what we'd hope in FA, activating the NRF2 pathway, and that it might be efficacious. And that really led to designing the next clinical trial, which was going to be the pivotal study. We still didn't have um, any data on pharmacokinetics, so dosing this drug in children. We didn't have juvenile toxicology data. Um, and so Riata just did not feel that they would be successful with um, proposing a study that included children at that time. Um, we were trying to move this program forward as quickly as possible. We were excited by the results from the MOXIE study. And so did launch the second study in individuals 16 to 40 years old. Again, we still didn't know if the drug was gonna work and you know, you're know you balancing this, how do we move quickly? Um, and how do we do good clinical trials and you know, meeting the needs of the whole community um, was still something we were discussing. And we continued to talk to them about how to bring a pediatric development plan along with the plan that was already moving forward. And we got positive results in, in late 2019 of that clinical trial, and that began discussions with FDA to see if the results of that clinical trial would be sufficient to approve the drug. It was a long process to get there. Um, FDA did not agree immediately that the results of that study were sufficient to support approval. It was possible that additional studies were going to be needed. Um, there was just several years of back and forth with the FDA, additional data being accumulated from the open label extension study. Um, and there was a, a long period of time where we were not certain that Skyclaris would be approved. And there was a delay in launching the pediatric studies during this time because we might have had to do additional clinical trials. And so that's just a little background on kind of how we got to where we are, which is having this approved drug without having it approved in children. The very first thing um, we said to Biogen when they acquired Riata, um, in 20, uh, it, last year in the fall was we have to get pediatric studies up and going. And we had been working with Riata on this as well. Um, they were developing a plan to initiate pediatric trials. And Biogen has been working closely with FARA and the uh, clinician researchers in the community to develop a path forward to um, begin pediatric studies. You might be asking, why do we need pediatric studies? This is some of the older data um, from the very first clinical trial where we were looking at different doses in adults. Um, and that data here, MOXIE part one, is on the right side of the slide. And without going into kind of all the technical details, I hope you can appreciate that um, this this one graph here with the AST at the top is looking at a biochemical measure in the blood um, that is directly linked to the activity of the drug. And you can see here at the lower doses, you're not seeing engagement or activity of this AST enzyme. But as we get to increased doses, you do see a dose-dependent increase in this AST um, as the dose of the drug goes up. But importantly, what you also see is that when you get to higher doses, it goes back down. And we see the same thing um, in the clinical measure, the MFARS. 
that as we tested increasing doses, the MFARS improvement got better, but if we went too high, the drug did not work. And the same thing was true in some of the preclinical studies that you can see on the left, which are FA uh, muscle cells from individuals with FA that were tested um, in the lab. And again, the same thing, there's a dose dependent increase, but if you go too high, um, the drug does not work. And so it's critically important that we understand what the right dose will be for children. We can't assume that children will just need half the dose of adults or a percentage of the dose in adults. It may be that children of different age ranges or different size ranges might need different doses. And that's the next thing that needs to be um, conducted is what we call a pharmacokinetic study to really understand what the right dose will be for children. So what else is going on in terms of our research pipeline? Um, there are a few other clinical trials that are ongoing right now that include children. Um, the first one that I'll give you a quick update on is for a drug called vitiquinone. And this drug's being developed by PTC Therapeutics. And the vitiquinone trial included uh, children down to the age, the age of seven, um, but there was also an additional small open label study initiated to gather safety data in children with FA down to the age of two. Um, and this is the first clinical trial that has been done where we have actually um, been able to, you know, extend the study um, an arm of the study to very, very young children. And so I'm optimistic that this will give us a nice path forward to follow um, for potentially other trials where we can start the trials in older kids and continue to move to younger children. And even if we don't evaluate efficacy in the younger children, if we can at least evaluate safety in them, that will hopefully allow for drugs when they're approved to have the broadest label possible for younger children. Um, this study had its results read out uh, towards the end of last year. And this is just a brief overview of that. Um, on the right-hand side, um, the graph is showing you um, in gray is the placebo and in green is the treatment group. Um, here, the scale is reversed from the scale I showed you with the Skyclaris results. And so what you see is that people in the placebo group got worse um, by about three points and people in the vitiquinone group stayed about the same as their baseline, um, maybe only getting um, worse by 0.7 points. Unfortunately, this difference between placebo and treatment did not reach what we call statistical significance. It was close, um, but it did not reach statistical significance. But if we look at a portion of this neurologic rating scale, specifically the upright stability, which measures uh, balance and gait, um, the difference between the treatment group and the placebo group was statistically significant. And some of the other outcome measures that were assessed in the trial we're also close to significant or significant. And uh, one of the important measures was um, a patient reported outcome of fatigue. And you can see here that individuals in the treatment group reported much less fatigue than those in the placebo group. So PTC is currently um, meeting with regulatory agencies, both EMA and FDA to discuss these results and see if um, these results are sufficient to be able to move this program forward, and we hope to get more information on that um, later, hopefully this quarter, um, the beginning of this year. There is a study ongoing at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Dr. Shana McCormick and Kim Lin um, are looking at a supplement called NAD and also um, an intervention of exercise. And this study is currently enrolling individuals ages 10 to 40, and um, you are randomized to different treatment groups uh, with the supplement and exercise. 
And given an exercise program on a recumbent bike, you get to keep the bike at the end. Um, and if you are randomized to a non-exercise group, um, you still have the ability to um, get access to the recumbent bike and the exercise protocol um, after your treatment portion of the study is over. For folks who are interested in this, I put um, their study coordinator, Anna, her contact at the top. The goal is to finish this study this year, um, and they still need about 10 to 12 people to volunteer for this study. Laramar Therapeutics is developing um, a novel treatment approach for FA where the protein that's deficient for taxin is being replaced. So this is a, a protein replacement approach where the frataxin protein um, is put in a, a carrier vehicle that allows the frataxin to be delivered into the cell and specifically to the mitochondria. Laramar started these studies a few years ago and they just um, at the end of 2023 finished um, the first part of a phase two study where they were looking at two different doses of the drug over 28 days. So one month of dosing, uh, two different doses, and we're looking forward to hopefully to get to seeing those results um, later this quarter, at the beginning of this year. And Laramar has, um, I think, you know, at least shared with all of us the what we'd hope to be um, a, a model for how we can go forward with pediatric drug development, which is where they've started in adults, they've gotten um, some of the early studies done in adults that we understand more about the safety and the risks associated with the drug. They also started their juvenile toxicology studies at the same time that they started the adult studies. And now that they've got more safety data available and done the juvenile toxicology studies, they're now looking to start pediatric studies so that both the pediatric and the adult development can happen simultaneously. Um, and they are, like I said, they are in the process of talking to the regulatory agencies now um, about initiating the pediatric studies. And so we're hopeful that this may be initiated later this year. Um, so this is just kind of an overview of where some of the programs are in our treatment pipeline. And during the q and I'm happy to talk a little bit more about this. Um, just a little bit more about research going on in pediatrics. As I mentioned there, not only clinical trials, but you can also be involved by participating in what we call observational studies, natural history studies, biomarker studies. Uh, one of our big biomarker studies is called TRAC-FA. This is a neuroimaging study where we're looking at the brain and the spinal cord. And we started this study several years ago. And I just really want to um, acknowledge and thank so many people in our FA community for volunteering for this study. This is a global trial, um, and our goal was to um, enroll 200 individuals with FA, adults and children, and follow them um, over three years with these brain and spinal cord imaging. The researchers working on the study developed a special protocol that meant less time in the MRI scanner so that we could include children, um, including those down to the age of five years old. And initially we targeted to at least try and enroll eight individuals in the five to 10 year old range. And we were actually able to enroll 21, which is just phenomenal. And again, wanna thank you all for participating in this study and hope you'll continue to the end so that we have um, this longitudinal data. This will be the, the largest imaging study we've ever done in FA, um, and certainly um, the only imaging study that has ever been done in young children with FA. So why is this important? This is important because we need to be able to advocate with our industry partners, with our regulators, to be able to do clinical trials in young children. And to be able to do those trials, we need biomarkers and outcome measures. Um, 
And so that is really where um, the research, you know, continues where FARA's effort has really continued. Earlier this year, the FARA staff and several FA parents help us put together what we called a pediatric white paper. And the goal of this white paper was really to encourage all of our industry partners to start thinking about pediatric drug development very early in their drug development process um, and not after they've done studies in adults. And we point out in the white paper um, both guidance from the FDA and the EMA that support pediatric trials. Um, and so really lay out for them a path forward um, for parallel drug development. We are investing more of our research dollars into tools that will help design better clinical trials for kids. So specific pediatric outcome measures, especially for those young kids in that five to 10 year old range, um, as well as out, uh, biomarkers that might help us you know, shorten the length of trials or have outcome measures that are more appropriate for young kids. Um, quickly go through some of this, but you know, we've been really trying to circulate our white paper and our community's um, support for pediatric trials with our pharmaceutical companies. We are trying to encourage, um, like I said, more of this research in young children. We've engaged a group of physical therapists who specialize in evaluating young children to help us develop some novel outcome measures. We recently worked with the University of Rochester on a new uh, patient reported outcome measure for parents of young children. And we're working with several different research groups to utilize digital health technologies, wearable devices, um, to try and help with better, more sensitive outcome measures in young children. And with that, um, I would like to kind of shift gears in the final few minutes of our presentation to ask Ron to share with you where we are with some of our advocacy initiatives. So hello, everybody. I'm sure you can see, if you, if you hadn't seen before, why we we're also fortunate in the FA community to have Jen Farmer leading our efforts. Um, uh, she's already uh, uh, indicated to you, and I'd like to echo that uh, we are all in, in terms of pediatric inclusion, and we've always been all in in pediatric inclusion. And um, our latest initiatives, um, it, uh, Jen mentioned uh, the Farrah White Paper that was aimed at convincing um, and informing our industry partners and prospective industry partners of the flexibility we believe does exist at the FDA uh, in terms of including pediatric subjects early in, in their clinical development. Um, we, we continue to use that white paper in all of uh, the other efforts we're, that we have ongoing, one of which is we're, we're really enthused about the fact that we are leading an effort to organize uh, a full day workshop later this and early th this year uh, that will pull together all the stakeholders, the FDA, the NIH, patient advocates from uh, all over, uh, our industry partners, regulatory advisors, trial designers, bioethicists, all the people that we need to get on the same page uh, and, and understanding and clarifying what flexibility does exist and um, how, what's what are the requirements for exercising that flexibility? What do you need to take to the regulators to convince them that they could demonstrate that kind of flexibility? Um, what I like to say is what we're trying to do with this workshop is also to advance what we see as a shift in the overall perception. Um, from the old adage that we need to protect children from clinical trials um, and the, the experimentation of clinical trials, shift from that to protecting our children with clinical trials that are carefully um, and well-designed to uh, assure their earlier access to safe and effective drugs. That's what we're after. And we think this workshop will be a, a milestone in accomplishing that. We're also um, doing two other things this year. 
Uh, one is I'm serving on the National Academy of Sciences Committee, um, congressionally mandated to explore and report on the flexibility at the FDA and the, uh, its European counterpart, the European Medicine Agency. And I've been successful in interjecting this pediatric inclusion topic uh, in that report um, that's, that we will discuss uh, in two weeks' time uh, at our next meeting. Finally, we're working to insert the same topic in all of the major uh, conferences coming up later this year, including, for example, the World Orphan Drug Congress that will be in Boston uh, in a few months. And so we're all in, all together, all the time, and, and including your children, our children, in these pediatric uh, studies. So thank you. So thank you, Ron, and maybe you should stay on because um, in our, our final, I think our final slide is just to summarize for all of you kind of what you can do um, right now. And so in terms of our advocacy agenda for this coming year um, in the U.S. specifically, there is the renewal of an, uh, of an important incentive for our industry partners related to developing therapies for children with rare diseases. Um, this is a pediatric rare disease uh, voucher. This program was initiated several years ago and it is currently, um, it will expire in September of this year. And so we are working hard to get this renewed. Um, I would just like to point out that when this um, program first came about, Ron was absolutely essential to making sure that the language um, for this program would be inclusive of conditions like FA that included populations of both children and adults. The first version of this language um, would have left FA out um, had it not been for Ron and his efforts to make this known to the right people and to propose alternative language that would make sure that we were included in these kinds of important programs. We also need to continue to make sure that, you know, along with FARA, our government partners are helping us fund this research. And so advocacy in terms of more resources for the FDA, for the NIH, for um, the Department of Defense CDMRP grant programs, allow for all of our scientists to be able to access more resources for research. And this is incredibly important. And you can be very active in reaching out to your legislators and making sure that they know how important these resources are for you and for your family. And finally there, um, one of the bills I mentioned earlier, or one of the acts of legislation that encourages um, and mandates pediatric trials for pediatric diseases um, does currently have an exclusion for rare diseases. And there is um, new language that's been introduced to eliminate this exclusion. And that is something that we are looking into this year to figure out what the best position will be um, in terms of advocacy related to this bill to make sure that we continue to promote pediatric drug development. And as Ron mentioned, we are working globally with um, other regulatory partners. And one of the, the real goals there is to make sure that as much as possible, flexibility can be applied and that we have um, similar guidances and regulations globally, that there isn't disparity um, globally, especially in the context of rare disease. And so, just real quick to wrap up and move to your questions. What can you do right now? Um, number one, if you or your child is not in our patient registry, I ask that you please um, make sure that you're in our patient registry. We get asked all the time by industry sponsors, how many children are there with FA? And this is a great way for us to share data, not individual data, but aggregate community data about how big is our pediatric population. And that kind of data is really important to advising how clinical trials get designed 
and and really promoting how important this is and and quantifying our our community. I invite you to participate in research if you haven't already, or at least think about it. And we have some great resources on our website to introduce you to participation in research and tools to kind of navigate you through that process and things to think about both for you and for your child um, as you volunteer for research or consider that volunteer activity. Encourage you to continue to stay informed, um, following our newsletters, follow us on social media, and most importantly, encourage you to advocate as well. Um, having you or your child, especially share your story with FA, um, not only with, with legislators for sure, but um, within your broader community, with some of our um, research partners, um, is so impactful. Um, there isn't a time when somebody from our FA community shares their story that they don't make a lasting impact. And so with that, um, I will pause and maybe shift to some of your questions. Ron, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at the Q&A. Yeah, I, I uh, just saw one uh, question pop up at, that asked, and now it's not on, there it is. Um, how does FARA plan to continue engaging with parents on this topic in the future? How can we best be engaged in an organized, streamlined, and planful manner uh, to move things forward? I think Jen's uh, penultimate slide was a good uh, good place to go with that, if you want to go back to that. They're, they're, uh, the, in fact, the last two slides, um, those are the ways that, that you can participate now um going forward and we will we are absolutely committed to staying engaged with all of you uh, on these very important topics but uh jen you might just quickly go over your key points in those last two slides yeah um thank you ron and elizabeth thank you for this great question um we do um want to make sure that we continue to communicate um on where we're going with all of these activities and find ways for our community to be directly involved um, all the time. And so one, um, one thought is that we do these kinds of um, webinars or meetings on more of a regular basis, like a quarterly basis. And you know, we, we have an ambassador program for um, teens and adults with FA to be able to be more engaged. And so we're hopeful that um, maybe if we can do these kind of quarterly meetings with parents um, as well, that this would be another way for us to engage all of you in this process and help you know where you can be most effective um, in making an impact. So there's more to come on that. Um, yeah. This was sort of the prequel to it. Um, we're planning to follow up with a survey, kind of just a quick follow-up survey on this webinar and asking you if this is something that you would be interested in. And there's a, a, a another question that closely follows that one. And how, how can we simply, and this is from um, Holly Ernest, uh, how can we uh, simplify parent uh, and patient involvement in advocacy uh, there may be available uh, already, but um, scripts, links, and contact information of who to communicate with or guidance on how to get be more impactful in our local areas. Uh, all kinds of great answers to that wonderful question, uh, one of which is that our advocacy uh, committee chair, Bridget Brennan, is always looking uh, for families who are willing to tell their story uh, in their local communities and nationally uh, as part of our overall um, advocacy effort that uh, is focused on several things. First, it'll be Rare Disease Week coming up at the end of February, uh, end of next month. Uh, each year we go to the Hill um, with our advocacy colleagues around the country 
um, and and tell our stories and and advocate for some of the things that Jen has just put up on a, a, a previous slide. We always advocate for uh, resources for the NIH and the FDA. We always advocate for our um, uh, research funding from the Department of Defense and the congressionally mandated um, uh, medical research uh, initiative. Um, and and then there there are local uh, activities that in which you can approach your local represent representatives uh, on on all these issues, uh, and we will keep you closely informed of what we decide uh, can be best suited to our efforts to save the PD, uh, rare disease priority review voucher program and the um, pediatric research equity act. Uh, we'll, we'll figure out what our best position is on that. So all kinds of ways you can help, but I would emphasize too what Jen uh, indicated about your participation in our research is probably the most profoundly beneficial way you can help us advocate. Uh, participating in the National History Study, enrolling in our uh, patient registry, uh, participating in clinical trials, these are the power <laughs> Uh, approaches for all of our advocacy with a, uh, industry partners as well as our government partners. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Ron. Um, and just uh, maybe just a, a quick follow on to that. Um, a lot of times when we do reach out to individuals in the community for advocacy support, um, reaching out to your legislators or to industry partners, we are able to assist you in that process, whether that's developing scripts, making sure you know what the key asks are, what the key talking points are. So we are able to support you in those activities. So we're hopeful that you'll, you know, volunteer for some of those activities, but know that you will be supported um, when you volunteer for those activities. So I think there were a few questions related to um, Sky Claris and OMAV. Let me move back to the top of our question queue here. So um, Holly asked another question about the, the dose of OMAV and you're right, it's not really one size fits all. That's why we need the pediatric dose study. Um, and um, Padraig has asked as well for sort of an, an update on the plans for the Sky Claris clinical trial. Um, so I did, um, ask Biogen if they could share an update with us um, for this meeting. They're, they're not ready to share a detailed update on their timeline right now, but um, they, they did want me to be able to reiterate that they are planning to open, um, to begin a phase one single dose study of OMAV in pediatric patients with FA um, it has been delayed in opening because of constructive feedback that they've gotten from the FDA, and they've been working to incorporate FDA's feedback into their study design going forward. And they are, they, they hear you. We have shared with them your comments, your feedback, your, um, you know, some of the articles that you've been writing and commenting on online about the importance of this. Um, of pediatric development of OMAF, and they they hear you. They 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 are reading um, what you are sharing with them, and they want you to know that they are working diligently to incorporate this FDA feedback, um, incorporate FDA's feedback into their phase one study design, and to advance what they want as a robust and adequate clinical development plan to establish both the safety, the dose, and the efficacy of OMAV in the pediatric population. And, you know, they're having to put some additional time in now to, for that development program um, in hopes that it will meet all the requirements of the regulatory authorities and support the future approval and access of OMAV for children with FA globally, and that they will continue to provide um, community updates as soon as they are able to do so. 
I'll, I'll raise the next question. If you're finished with that, Jen. Yep. Okay. Um, Norm Simpson um, asked to, for a brief de uh, definition of what a white paper is. Um, very important question because we just sort of glossed over that. But this white paper we, we've both discussed um, that was targeting our industry partners was really a collection of three things. It was a collection of all the things that FARA and our clinical and, and uh, basic scientists have um, assembled uh, on the pediatric uh, research front. All the assets that we have that would help inform pediatric uh, research in, in clinic. Um, and secondly, it was an assemblage of all the statements uh, out of guidance packages and in public statements like last year's rare disease day at the FDA, that uh, all the um, commitments from the FDA about their uh, interest in um, including pediatric subjects as early as possible in clinical research. And so, and, and thirdly, we, we put those two things together to uh, emphasize with our industry partners why how much guidance is available uh, to demonstrate uh, available flexibility at the FDA and the EMA and what they need to do to, um, uh, uh, you know, achieve, uh, uh, you know, acquisition to that kind of flexibility in terms of preclinical data, um, data from other clinical trials. I'll just illustrate with one point the FDA emphasized on Rare Disease Day last year. They used SMA and in, in, uh, their, their, their approval of, uh, of the SMA gene therapy, um, uh, Zolgensma, um, by saying, you know, we started with infants um, in, in SMA. Well, of course, in SMA, you know, infants are mortally uh, affected. Uh, without treatment, they can die in their second year. Uh, so it's natural enough that they were able to start with infants uh, in, um, in SMA. But we've emphasized with them, too, that a lot of our rare neurodegenerative diseases, um, they, they're not, you know, are, you know, they're not as early uh, mortal, but um, there's damage done early. And so we need some consideration of how to start early in pediatric subjects um, while you know, there's a full uh, treatment window wide open, widest open. And um, um, when, when they are uh, best suited for treatment. So that's, that's roughly what we tried to summarize in that white paper, Norm. Um, so this is a question that's maybe a little different, um, which is how will we be able to distinguish between kind of, I think, the natural child clumsiness and FA and outcome measures? And I think this also is linked, this question is linked to, you know, in young children, they're still developing and they're still acquiring skills. And so how do, how can we develop a sensitive measures that can distinguish normal childhood development or variation in children. You know, some children are more athletic, more clumsy than others. And so how, how can you distill out what's FA from normal, the range of normal development? And that is something that we are actively working on. Um, and that's why we've engaged a group of physical therapists who all they do every day is evaluate children and their motor and their gross motor and fine motor development and see if they can help us find more sensitive tools um, that we can use that will allow us to, to have these kinds of sensitive measures. Um, and so I don't have the answer yet, but that is, you know, part of the ongoing research and one of the things that we um, are trying to develop. The tools that we currently have, like the MFARS and our upright stability scale and some of the digital devices that are in early development um, are sensitive in children with FA. 
um, down to about age 10. So it's really where, where we're really lacking tools is in the, the younger children. Um, and so we can still do clinical trials in children with FA. Um, I don't want you to think that that's an obstacle. We can do trials in children um, and we can, we do have tools that are sensitive, like I said, down to the age of 10. And one way in which, you know, I think the PTC study did this really nicely was they, you know, opened up a second arm of the study to evaluate safety in the younger kids where we didn't have as robust outcome measures for efficacy but allowed us to get safety data in those younger children while evaluating efficacy in the older children. Um, some questions here also about um, gene therapies. And I know we're coming up on the hour, so we'll try and be succinct in answering some of your final questions. Um, gene see. therapy and gene editing were both Yeah, I'm trying to go. Yeah back to those. Um, so, you know, our gene therapy studies that are currently ongoing to evaluate gene therapy for the cardiomyopathy in FA are starting out in adults with FA. Um, and I think we would expect that at this point because um, gene therapy is brand new and the long-term safety and efficacy is not well known. We still need to understand what the risks um, and potential benefits can be. Um, but we are already talking to Lexio and other companies that are developing gene therapies, not just for cardiomyopathy, but also for, um, for the neurologic symptoms of FA. How do you build a program that moves to pediatrics as quickly as possible? And I think all of our industry partners working on ge genetic medicines, whether it's gene replacement or gene editing approaches, um, understand that it's important for us to move from adults to children as quickly as possible because these genetic therapies are one-time therapies and we do want to initiate them as early in the disease process as possible for maximal benefit. Um, and we've last year hosted a meeting with FDA with members of the FA community as well as our industry sponsors to make this point to FDA as well, that we need their help and flexibility as we design these clinical development programs for gene therapies to be able to move to studies, including children as quickly as possible. Um, there's the, a the lot. Last... Yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Ron, um, if you have last... a chance to look at the questions, that'd be helpful. Yeah, yeah. Um... There was one question just asked that's really pertinent to today's webinar. Are there established guidelines or recommendations regarding the timeline for pediatric clinical stu studies once it's approved for adults? Well, the answer is yes. There, there are extensive guidelines and guidances from the FDA that always emphasize the need to have established safety and to uh, have established the uh, potential uh, for direct benefit to pediatric subjects before in introducing pediatric studies. We're, we're trying to get inside that now with the FDA and with our white paper to, uh, to try to explore um, you know, how we can start pediatric studies before we, we get approvals in adults. We wanna get, get the pediatric subjects engaged in the same protocol that's engaging adults. Like Jen mentioned earlier, we've done that in other uh, studies like idebinone and vitiquinone. We, we did a adult cohort, adolescent cohort, uh, child cohort. But uh, so the guidances are complex. We're trying to work with the FDA and our industry partners, make sure we take advantage of every piece of flexibility available. Well, I know we're a little past uh, the top of the hour, and so I want to be respectful of everyone's time. I want to thank you all um, very much for joining this webinar. I hope it is the first um, of several for this year's where we can continue to 
um, gather together to share updates from our treatment pipeline programs, as well as our research initiatives and engage with you um, on how we continue to work together to advance pediatric research in FA. Um, as I mentioned, we will follow up with a short survey about the webinar. We hope that you'll give us your feedback and if you'd be interested again in continuing this dialogue with us throughout the year and, and hopefully next time it'll be less of a presentation and more of a more of a dialogue like we've had here at the end. But um, thank you all so much for joining today and participating and look forward to seeing you all um, hopefully in person later this year. Bye, everybody.